Today, I want to spend a few minutes talking to you a little bit about how cardiologists use the actual cardiac CT data that we perform as part of pulmonary vein ablation evaluation. So as you probably know, in pulmonary vein ablation, this is primarily performed for tachyarrhythmias and most commonly for AFib. There can be radiofrequency ablation or cryoablation performed by the cardiologist. At our institution, we primarily perform radiofrequency ablation as we found it more reliable and reproducible. The primary purpose of performing the cardiac CT is to define the anatomy. We give the cardiologist volume rendered images which clearly define the anatomy as well as the actual source axial data set which they import into software which allows them to perform real-time mapping with their catheters onto the CT data set. We do make some size measurements of the vein ostea but this is primarily for evaluation if the patient returns with problems such as shortness of breath. Pulmonary vein anatomy can be evaluated using CT. It has the ability to decrease the procedure time and also to decrease the amount of radiation the patient is getting during the procedure because the anatomy is clearly defined. MRI is also used at many institutions, although we found for our purposes CT is better, especially given the decreasing radiation dose that is now possible with iterative reconstruction and other dose reduction techniques with CT. Obviously, the advantage of MRI is, is that during the scan itself, there is no ionizing radiation because remember, the patient will receive radiation during the procedure from fluoroscopy. Other ways to look at the anatomy include intracardiac echocardiography, transesophageal echocardiography, which is generally performed prior to the procedure at our institution to confirm there is no clot within the left atrial appendage, and reflux venography, which as you can imagine is relatively difficult to be able to reflux contrast against the flow of blood into the pulmonary veins. Here's our CT data set. We have axial CT images as well as coronal and sagittal images. And my point of showing you these images is just to show you that in general, I find the sagittal data set the best to try to evaluate what the pulmonary vein anatomy is. Then if I have questions, I use the axial and coronals to correlate with the sagittal data set to be able to clearly define the anatomy. One thing I want to point out about the contrast technique is, is that we actually perform a scan from the bottom up, so from the lung bases through the aortic arch. And the reason for doing that is, is we actually do a calculation and time the amount of contrast and follow the contrast with saline so that we wash out the pulmonary artery. And that way there's a significant difference in Hounsfield units between the pulmonary arteries and the pulmonary veins. This allows our techs when performing the volume rendered images to use a threshold technique rather than actually having to cut. As you can imagine, if you had to place a cut line between the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vein, you could very easily get into the pulmonary venous anatomy. So we use a threshold technique and by being able to separate the Hounsfield units of the pulmonary arteries and the pulmonary veins, we're very easily able to make volume rendered images such as those you see here which clearly define the anatomy. Here are some volume rendered images with just a couple of the common variants. Again, remember that this is the one time in radiology where left is left and right is right because we're looking from the posterior aspect of the left atrium. The image on your left demonstrates three pulmonary veins on the right, so this is a right middle pulmonary vein. Keep in mind that the right pulmonary vein does not necessarily have to drain the right middle lobe, but can actually drain the superior segment of the right lower lobe. And then your image on your right demonstrates a common ostium on the left. When we actually do the post-processing, we actually put center lines down the pulmonary veins into the left atrium. We follow along that center line till we get to the ostium with the left atrium and then we make a bi-dimensional measurement as you can see in the bottom corner. So we get true cross-sectional bi-dimensional measurements of the pulmonary vein ostea. Here's a cartoon representation of what happens during the procedure. Catheters are placed along the femoral vein up into the right heart. They are poked across at the level of the fossa ovala and then the procedure is performed in the left atrium. The catheter you see here with the somewhat pigtail loop at the end has multiple silver electrodes on it. These silver electrodes are able to produce tracings and therefore the site of anomalous electrical activity is identified. 
Then an ablation catheter is used to ablate the area of abnormal electrical activity. So the idea is, is that there's a sleeve of endocardium which goes out, extends out into the proximal portion of the pulmonary veins. The abnormal electrical activity is coming from this sleeve of tissue and conducts back into the body of the left atrium and thus results in the AFib. Now initially, ablations were performed in spot locations, but however, it was discovered that when this occurred, that another location developed a driving electrical activity that caused the AFib. So now in general, what occurs is there's ablation that completely isolates the pulmonary vein ostea from the body of the left atrium using a circumferential ablation technique. As you can see, here are the fluoroscopic images. To the right, you can see a right atrial catheter. You can see a coronary sinus catheter, which is used to overdrive and make sure that the electrical pathways are totally ablated. The loop catheter, which we just showed you, and the ablation catheter in place. Here is a representation of the CT software that the cardiologist have. We are able to load our data set into the software and then they align the anatomy with these tubes that they draw with the catheter. So to draw the tubes, they place the catheter out into each of the structures and then they pull the catheter back into the body of the left atrium and make these tubes and then they line our CT data set anatomy up with those tubes. If they didn't do this, they would actually have to uh, poke a catheter around and make this more crude model. You can see here that the catheter is represented within the anatomy as well as these ablation site dots. Now this was one performed not for a fib but for an another tachyarrhythmia. This is the latest and greatest that they have to offer. There's actually the ability to magnetically control the ablation catheter now. There are magnets that are placed adjacent to the patient and depending on how close they're placed next to the patient, they have 0 0.08 Tesla or 0 0.1 Tesla strengths. Using these magnets, they're able to adjust where the catheter is within the body of the left atrium. So here you can see the catheter is being directed within the left atrium and the multiple red dots represent the areas of ablation. You can see that they're ablating and separating electrically isolating the pulmonary vein ostea from the body of the left atrium. I want to say just a slight bit about complications. Here's a couple cases from the literature. One showing pulmonary vein occlusion and another showing pulmonary vein stenosis. We've actually had one case of pulmonary vein occlusion at our institution which was able to be surgically repaired. The more deadly complication associated with pulmonary vein ablation is a connection between the atrium and the esophagus and atrioesophageal fistula. So many cardiologists may ask you to identify where the esophagus is with respect to the left atrium. Be aware that the esophagus does move normally. So during the procedure, the esophagus is going to be moving around. So what our cardiologists have actually done is, is they actually place a NG tube down so they can constantly identify where the esophagus is with respect to the left atrium. If there's an ablation that erodes through the left atrial wall into the esophagus, you can get an atrioesophageal fistula, which for whatever reason doesn't appear to have significant bleeding associated with it, but you will notice air within the left atrial or ventricular cavity. So it's very important to be aware after the procedure that you pay attention to air within the left side of the heart and be very suspicious for an atrioesophageal fistula. So just as a quick overview, we've talked about pulmonary vein anatomy. We've talked about the source data set for real-time navigation and decreased procedure times and therefore decreased radiation dose to the patient during the actual procedure and briefly about some complications you might experience. Thank you very much for your time, and if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at the email below.